Goedenavond gemeente, aan allemaal van jullie hartelijk welkom hier vanavond. Um, namens die kerkraad wil ik net gauw die afkondigings vir julle deurgeen. Die eerste afkondiging is die kerkraad vergader aanstaande dinsdag aan 26 juli om 8 uur. Ook die Jakens vergader die vier dinsdag aan 26 juli ook om 8 uur. Die derde punt is ons offergaves is vandaag bestemd voor hulpbehoevende theologische studenten en voor de theologische opleiding. Volgende week is ons offergaves bestemd voor de diakonie en voor de zending. En aan het laatste en van onze eredienst zal Dr. John Smith van de CRTS hier voorgaan. Brother Smith, welkom. On behalf of the congregation, we, uh, yeah, we hope uh, to learn from you. Um, May God bless you in your service. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's good to be here with you. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in the Canadian Reformed Churches. I also had a special request uh, from Professor Arjen de Visser to give greetings from him and his wife, Inge. Let us also receive the greetings of our Savior in heaven, so please stand. As congregation, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Amen. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us now sing the hymn, Holy, 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 the verses 2 and 3. Let us now pray together. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we come before you to worship you because you are the God who is holy, holy, holy. In heaven, the cherubim and the seraphim are around your throne, giving praise to you, and so also the saints in glory. And Father, we here below, your church here on earth, we join together with that heavenly chorus and we give glory to your name. We thank you that we may do so. We thank you that you give us opportunity to sing praises to your name and to give you glory, for you alone deserve all glory in heaven and on earth. 
Father, we pray for this world in which we live. There are so many people who do not know you. There are people who know something of you, but live their lives as though you do not exist. And yet, Father, you've placed us here on this earth to give you praise in all that we say and do and think. Father, we confess that you are not always in the forefront of our minds either. Even though we know you through your Son, Jesus Christ, and even though we know of you in your Holy Word, and even though we can see the testimony of your greatness in creation all around us, yet, Father, so often our thoughts are busy with ourselves. And we pray, Father, that you would bless us in this afternoon and that you would turn our hearts upward again. And Father, we pray that you would renew our hope and strengthen our faith and give us joy in your presence as we open your living word and drink in the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit and that you would conform us to the likeness of your Son. Father, if we've come here with burdens, we pray that you would lighten our loads. If we've come here with confused thoughts, we pray that you would set our compass straight again. And Father, if we are simply catching our breath from busy lives, we pray that you would give us rest in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, if we are experience, experiencing hurt and pain, we pray that you would give us comfort with the gospel. And Father, if we've become hardened to the gospel and no longer hear it as we should, we pray that you would rekindle in us a zeal to serve you. Father, if we are straying from you and living in sin, we pray that you would confront us and convict us and bring us to repentance. Receive our praises and our prayers and bless us now with your Holy Spirit as we open your word together. We ask this all in the name of Jesus, our precious Savior and everlasting King. Amen. Before we open God's holy word together, let's sing once again. We will sing Psalm 18, the stanzas 1, 5, and 7.
Let's now open our Bibles together. Our first scripture reading from the Old Testament is 2 Kings 24. 2 Kings 24, and there we read the verses 8 through 17. Two Kings 24, beginning at verse 8, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made, as the Lord had foretold. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, and the chief men of the land he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah Jehoiachin's uncle king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. Now we turn also in the New Testament to Revelation chapter 4. And here we read some of the revelation that the Lord Jesus gave to the Apostle John, Revelation 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So far the reading of God's word. We will now sing together from Psalm 137, the psalm that the exiles sang by the waters of Babylon, Psalm 137, the verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This evening, brothers and sisters, we will turn to Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophecies of Ezekiel chapter 1. There we read God's word as follows. In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Kibar Canal, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kibar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire as it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot and they sparkled like burnished bronze. 
Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, and their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them, and when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood. And when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like awe-inspiring crystal, spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another and each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire, and closed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, our text for this evening takes us to a low point in the history of God's people. It takes us to the days of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar brought the people of Judah and Jerusalem into exile. Perhaps you remember that the exile happened in two stages. The first stage is the passage that we read from 2 Kings 24. There we read about the very short reign of King Jehoiachin. 
After only three months on the throne, Jehoiachin surrendered to the king of Babylon and was taken into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar also took along anyone who might pose a threat to his authority in the future. He took Jehoiachin's mother, his wives, his officers, and the mighty of the land, the cream of the crop. Nebuchadnezzar also took the best of the army, 7,000 valiant men, as well as 1,000 craftsmen, and it says that he even took the smiths. The rest of the people were left behind in Jerusalem, and Nebuchadnezzar appointed a new king, Zedekiah, to be their king. And so God's people were divided. One part was in Babylon, in exile. The other part was left behind in the land of Judah. That was the situation at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel. And it shows us, brothers and sisters, that God's plan of salvation was far from finished. After all, God does not want a divided church, but one holy Catholic church standing in worship before his throne. God always works to gather his church together. And he does that through human instruments, through people whom he calls to the task. At that low point in the history of God's people, when the church was split in two, God called two of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. One was to work among God's people in Jerusalem. That was Jeremiah. The other was to work among God's people in Babylon, and that was Ezekiel. Today we will consider the call of the prophet Ezekiel. And so I proclaim to you the word of God under this theme, God reveals his glory amid his church in exile. We will see, first of all, that he does so to earthen vessels, secondly, with heavenly majesty, and thirdly, in a rainbow of grace. First then, God reveals his glory to earthen vessels. Among the exiles who were carried off to Babylon was a young man by the name of Ezekiel. Ezekiel says that he was among the captives by the river Kibar, which is a river in the land of Babylon. And our text begins with the words, in the 30th year. Now we might wonder, in the 30th year of what? The Bible does not say. We know that it was not the 30th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. It was also not the 30th year of the exile, because verse 2 says that it was only five years since Jehoiachin had been captured. The best solution is quite simply that it was the 30th year of Ezekiel's life. Now, why would Ezekiel want to tell us this, that he was 30 years old? Well, I would like you to notice that Ezekiel was from a priestly family. Verse 3 introduces him as Ezekiel the priest. And the 30th year was a very special year for a priest. The Bible tells us in the book of Numbers, Numbers 4, verse 30, that a priest was to begin the service of the tabernacle when he reached the age of 30. So Ezekiel in exile is telling us that this is the year when he would have become a priest. If he were still in Jerusalem, he would this year have begun to serve in the temple. But he's not in Jerusalem. He is in exile, away from the temple, and he has been for the past five years already. There is no temple for him to serve there. There's no altar for him to offer sacrifices. Ezekiel missed out on his own ordination. How difficult that must have been for him. As a child, 
Ezekiel would have looked forward to a life of service before the ark, the place where God dwelled in the temple between the cherubim, the place where so many generations of his forefathers had ministered before the Lord. Ezekiel would have been set apart for the priesthood from birth. He knew from childhood already what he would become when he was grown up. And now here he was, a priest in exile, and his whole life before him empty. What would he do now? But think not only of Ezekiel, think also of the rest of the exiles there along the Kibar water canal. They were far away from the temple, far from the presence of God, away from the sacrifices. There was no more atonement for their sins, no ministry of reconciliation, no more fellowship with the Lord. Here indeed they will have felt forsaken by God. And when you realize this, brothers and sisters, then Ezekiel's opening words hit you between the eyes. He says, As I was among the captives by the river Kibar, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel in the land of the Chaldeans. The hand of the Lord was upon him there. Now this is not the first time that God's word went out in Babylon. Many centuries earlier, in the very beginning, way back in Genesis chapter 12, the word of the Lord came to Abram, who lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. And there the Lord had said to Abram, go out of your country and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. What had become of that blessing? Here are the children of Abraham back in the land of the Chaldeans again, back where they started from. Have God's promises to Abram failed? Well, now that is why the word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel in the land of the Chaldeans. It comes in a spectacular vision of the glory of God. God sends a clear message that he is not too weak to fulfill his purposes. He is not finished with his people yet. He will accomplish his plans. He will gather his church. Just when it seems that Babylon has won, God displays his sovereignty and his power. The one phrase that keeps coming back through the whole book of Ezekiel is this, that you may know that I am the Lord. And that is God's message to his church in exile. God reveals his glory in exile. And God does that more often in the Bible. Think also of the passage that we read from the book of Revelation. There the apostle John was also in exile on the island of Patmos. John saw a vision which is much like that of Ezekiel. The heavens are opened and he sees the four living creatures. He sees the throne of God and the one who sits upon it. But notice too that both of these visions are given to individuals. John was alone on the island of Patmos. And the vision of our text came to Ezekiel alone. The rest of God's people did not see it, not any more than we have. They simply had to believe what Ezekiel told them. They had to take his word for it. They had to trust that he was a true prophet sent from God and that he was not making it all up. They had to respond in faith to God's revelation, just as we have to. The vision that Ezekiel saw has come down to us through the ages, recorded on the pages of the Bible. 
How can we be sure that it really happened, that Ezekiel actually saw the things that are written in our texts? We have no way of checking. There is no one who can go up to heaven for us to see whether these things are real. God wants his church to live by faith, not by sight. But God is also willing to give you faith. He works it in your heart by the preaching of the gospel, which you also hear today. We might be tempted to be jealous of Ezekiel, to think that he is so much more fortunate than we are. After all, he was allowed to see the glory of God with his own eyes. There is no doubt, brothers and sisters, that Ezekiel was blessed. But remember, too, what the Lord Jesus said to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And keep in mind, too, that Ezekiel would not have an easy calling. Chapter 2 tells us that he would speak to a rebellious people who would not believe his words. Ezekiel would not have an easy life. And yet his ministry begins with a spectacular vision of the Most High God. It is as though God wants to burn upon Ezekiel's memory a lasting impression of his glory. No matter what difficulties Ezekiel may face in his ministry, he must remember the greatness of the God whom he serves. Today, the Lord no longer reveals himself to us in visions. God's self-revelation is recorded on the pages of Scripture. Ministers do not wait for a message to fall from heaven, but they devote themselves to studying the Bible. And yet ministers, too, are servants of God. And it is good for ministers to preach about the glory of God. Ezekiel 1 reminds us not to put human beings in the forefront. Humans are only instruments in the Lord's hands. They are only earthen vessels. The glory of God must remain front and center. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. We come to our second point. God reveals his glory with heavenly majesty. We come now to the vision itself. What exactly did Ezekiel see? He saw a storm cloud coming towards him from the north. And as it came closer, he saw that this was no ordinary cloud. A raging fire billowed out of it. Brightness surrounded it. And out of the cloud came four of the most astonishing creatures. So impressed is Ezekiel by the sight of these creatures that he devotes a full 19 verses to describing them, often repeating himself, seeming almost to stumble over his words. It seems that Ezekiel can hardly find words to describe them. They're simply out of this world. How can you describe something for which there are no words? Ezekiel does his best to describe the living creatures by comparing them to things that we can understand. They had the likeness of a man, he says in verse 5. And yet they were different from a man because each had four faces and four wings. Their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and when they ran back and forth, they looked like flashes of lightning. And when they flew, what a majestic sound their wings made, like the rush of many waters, like the voice of Almighty God, like the sound of an army. And with their four faces, they could look in all four directions at once without even turning around. Each living creature had the face of a man in front, the face of a lion on the right, the face of an ox on the left, and the face of an eagle in back. 
They also had hands like a man, a bronze color like a lion, feet like those of an ox, and wings like an eagle. From all sides they give the impression of raw power. Strong as an ox, swift as an eagle, fierce as a lion, and with all the resourcefulness of a man. Such are the four living creatures. And notice that they are called creatures. When we think of creatures, we think of the earthly animals that God has made, whales and elephants and goats and ants and giraffes and sable antelope. We forget, perhaps, that God also made creatures that are fit for life in heaven. You will not find them in a biology textbook, but they do exist. What are these creatures then? Ezekiel sees the same creatures again in chapter 10, and there he calls them cherubim. Well, we know what cherubim are. They're angels, aren't they? Perhaps you've seen pictures in books of cherubs. Artists sometimes give us a false impression of what angels are like, painting them as cute, roly-poly toddlers with curly hair and harps in their hands. But the living creatures of our text are nothing like that. They are fearsome beasts which inspire awe and dread. The first reference to cherubim in the Bible is found in Genesis 3, verse 24. After Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden, we read that cherubim were stationed there with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Well, now you know from Ezekiel 1 what fearsome beasts these cherubim were. There's no way that Adam and Eve would have been able to sneak past them. They even had eyes in the backs of their heads. And in the tabernacle, cherubim were woven into the fabric of the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Cherubim functioned as a warning to sinners to stay out of the place where holy God was. They had much the same purpose as a warning sign on an electrical transformer. Danger, keep out. If Ezekiel would have become a priest, he would have seen pictures of cherubim woven into the temple curtain and carved on the temple walls. But now, as a prophet, Ezekiel is allowed to see the real thing. Now, what are these cherubim doing in our text? Verse 15 gives us a clue. It says that beside each creature is a wheel. So there are four wheels. But notice that there are no axles between the wheels. The movement of the wheels is connected with the movement of the living creatures. When the creatures change direction, the wheels change direction with them. When the creatures went up or down, the wheels went up or down with them. And each wheel had another wheel inside it so that it could rotate in, in four different ways. It must have been something like this, the way the wheels were turning. And that way they could instantly change direction. What are we to make of this strange combination of cherubim and wheels? Well, the Hebrew word that is used for wheels in our passage is sometimes used in the Bible for the wheels of a chariot. And there is a very interesting passage in 1 Chronicles 28, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 18, where the cherubim are called the chariot of the Lord. Think of Psalm 18, which speaks of the Lord riding on the cherubim on the wings of the wind. Ezekiel 1 verse 22 tells us that above the heads of the living creatures, there was something like an expanse made of pure crystal, 
a platform, as it were. And above that platform was something with the appearance of a throne. So it is as though the cherubim are transporting the very throne of Almighty God. What Ezekiel describes in our text then is nothing less than the chariot of the Lord riding into battle. And God is in the driver's seat, brothers and sisters. He always is. Who is in control? Not Nebuchadnezzar with all his chariots, but the Most High God. He holds the reins of power. He is not weak. He has not forgotten his people in exile, but he rides forth in heavenly majesty to his church in exile to call Ezekiel to become a prophet of the Lord. Do you see something of the glory of the Lord, brothers and sisters? It's the glory that we're going to sing about with Psalm 68, verse 2, about the one who rides upon the clouds, to whom we must sing and give glory. And that is the glory that the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, shared with his heavenly Father before he came into the world. But the Lord Jesus laid his glory aside, and he humbled himself, becoming like a servant, becoming lower than the angels, lower than the cherubim. During his earthly ministry, our Lord Jesus Christ, you remember, once made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He was riding on a donkey while the crowds sang Hosanna and waved palm branches in the air. On that occasion, Matthew's gospel quotes from the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, where it says, Behold, your king comes to you lowly and sitting on a donkey. Sometimes we think of that entry into Jerusalem as a triumph, a triumphal entry. But really, it was a humiliation for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was on the road to the cross. The one who once rode upon the cherubim now rides on a donkey. He left behind his heavenly majesty for our sake. He became like one of us, taking the lowest place, the place of a slave, so that he might die the death of a sinner for us. But now he has returned triumphant to the glory that he has once enjoyed, enthroned at the Father's right hand, far above all angels and cherubim, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. To him belongs all dominion and power. And he is coming back soon with the clouds, with mighty angels and with blazing fire. That's how 2 Thessalonians 1 describes the return of Jesus. With the clouds, as God came in Ezekiel 1 with mighty angels, as Ezekiel saw him come, with blazing fire, which Ezekiel also saw. Ezekiel saw this all by himself. But on that future day when Christ returns, every eye will see him, and those who have rejected him will flee in terror before his majesty and will call upon the mountains to cover them because no one can stand before the glory of God. We come to our third point. At the beginning of the service, we sang the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And verse 3 there says, The eye made blind by sin, thy glory may not see. The eye made blind by sin, thy glory may not see. In other words, sinful people are not allowed to look at the glory of God. And yet Ezekiel did. That's what it says in verse 28 of our text. It speaks about the glory 
that Ezekiel saw. There was brightness all around him. At the end of verse 28, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, says Ezekiel, I fell on my face. How is it possible that Ezekiel could see this and yet survive? Well, I'd like you to notice from our passage that Ezekiel was not very close to the throne of God. He gives a very detailed description of the four living creatures. He had a close look at them. But they are as close as he comes to God's throne. The four living creatures are between Ezekiel and God. God himself is much higher up above the expanse, high above the throne. I would also like you to pay attention to the first part of verse 28. It says there, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. There was a rainbow around God's throne. Here in Cape Town, you have spectacular rainbows. I've only been here a little while, and yet I've seen them already. And we know that the rainbows in the sky remind us of God's promise to Noah in Genesis 9, never again to destroy the world with a flood. Now perhaps we sometimes think that the rainbow is put in the sky just for us to look at. But that's actually not what God says in Genesis 9. If you look carefully, Genesis 9 says, when the rainbow is seen in the clouds, then I will remember my covenant. In other words, God puts the rainbow in the sky to remind him to be gracious. And now our text says that there is a rainbow around God's throne, which means this, no matter which way God looks, he sees the rainbow. He sees everything through a rainbow. Isn't that an amazing thought? God can never forget his gracious promises. So yes, Ezekiel sees God's glory, but that glory is filtered through a rainbow of grace. And that rainbow is still there today, brothers and sisters. We read about it in Revelation 4, verse 3, where John says, there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So God can never forget his grace. We have even more grace in Jesus Christ, his son. When Jesus died on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain no longer stands between God and his people. The cherubim no longer blocked the way to paradise. The way to the tree of life is open again. In Christ, we have access to God's throne, to the most holy place. Christ has paid for our sins, and he will present us to his Father as a church that is holy and blameless. How terrible it will be for those who reject the Lord Jesus and want nothing to do with him. For them there is no atonement, no grace anymore. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A day is coming, brothers and sisters, when this world will be destroyed by fire, and no rainbow, no amount of rainbows will stop that day from coming. But for those who hope in the Lord, it is a day to look forward to, because we will see God just as Ezekiel did, the God who loves his church and cares for her, the God who gave his son to die for her, and the God who sustains us from day to day, we will see him as he is, with his likeness in front of us, how rich and full our joy shall be. Amen.
Let us now respond to the word of God by singing together Psalm 17, stanza 7. Brothers and sisters, let us now profess our faith in our triune God by singing together the Apostles' Creed, the Chalov's Belatedness. Let's do so standing. Let us now give thanks and pray together. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for setting us before us this glorious vision of who you are, a God who comes to his people in times of trouble, a God who comes to a people in exile and gives them hope and shows glory and power beyond belief. But Father, we thank you for the great hope that we can take from this message, knowing that in all the circumstances in which we find ourselves, you are sovereign, you are great, you are holy. And Father, we pray that you would help us to remember this. Also, as we sojourn here, we pray, Father, that you would surround us with your grace in Jesus Christ. We thank you for him that we could see something of the great love 
that our Savior has for us, that he left behind the splendor of holiness in heaven with you to become lower than the angels for a time, even the lowest of slaves. Father, we thank you that in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see his love in that he laid down his life, even enduring your wrath against sin, even enduring your holy anger. And he did that for us. Father, what love that is. And we thank you that you have now also exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. We thank you for the Holy Spirit whom you give to dwell in your church, to live in our hearts. And we pray, Father, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we may also witness to the world around us of who you are and of great, your great love for us in Jesus Christ and also that we may set before the world the need to know you, the need to repent of sin, the urgency of preparing for the return of Jesus Christ. Father, give us courage for that. Give us the words to say to our neighbors, our co-workers, those around us. And Father, we pray that you would also, also bless our testimony with fruit. And Father, grant that your church may grow. We pray that you would continue to bless us as congregation, surround us with your care and love. We pray that you would be with mission workers and missionaries and elders and deacons in the work that they do. Grant them strength for it, Father, and much wisdom. Be with each of us that we may be a hand and a foot to one another, encouraging one another helping one another. Father, help us to use the gifts that you've given to us in service to you and to all of us. Father, we pray that you would be with us in the week that lies ahead. Grant us strength for our labors. Grant us all that we need, whether it be in traveling, whether it be in working, whether it be in times of leisure. We pray that Whatever we put our hand to, we may have an eye for your glory in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so go with us, Father. Lighten our loads, carry our burdens, forgive our sins, grant us your grace each day again. We ask this all in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You have an opportunity to bring your offerings of thankfulness before the Lord. And after the collection has been taken, let's stand once again and sing Psalm 68, verse 2.
Brothers and sisters, receive now the blessing of the Lord and go your way with his peace upon your hearts. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace.